This is a, uh, go ahead and have a seat, bud. I uh, want to make a couple of introductions. Let me step here for just a second. This is Anne Marie, and I met Anne Marie. Uh, we spoke for the first time yesterday. Uh, many of you all know the story, or if you watched the news this week, it was a young student from Embry Riddle uh, who was in a motorcycle accident on Willow Creek this past Thursday. Um, that was Anne Marie's son. Uh, his name is uh, Caden, and Caden has been coming to our church uh, while he has been studying, and he was here on Easter Sunday, along with these young men, and, you know, we gave an offering, I'm sorry, uh, uh, an invitation at the end, and when they walked away, Marquise here said, I should have done that, I meant to do that, and Caden said, well, we're going to do it next week, and Anne-Marie is here to do this with these guys in Caden's honor. And so we want to uh, celebrate what God's doing in these students and the lives of these kids. Um, and, and we want to do it in a way uh, that honors the influence that Caden had in their life. And so uh, let me step in here for just a second. So guys, uh, you were here last week and you heard us talking about what it means to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. So I'm gonna give you the opportunity to do that right now before God and before our church family here. And so I wanna ask you say, to repeat this after me, say, I believe, I believe that, Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of the living God. And, I want him and I want him to be the Lord of my life. To be the Lord of my life. Amen. All right, Marcus, Marquis, tuck your toes right under that bar there, brother. Because of your confession of faith, today it is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. Because of your confession of faith, today it is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Cohen, because of your confession of faith, today it is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If God is all-knowing, then it stands to reason that He knows about all the pain and suffering in this world. Not only that, but if he's truly all-knowing, then he even knows about it before it happens. If God is all-powerful, then he definitely has the ability to stop the pain and suffering. If God is all-good, then wouldn't he want to stop it? But since pain, suffering, and all kinds of evil persist in this world, then it's our understanding that either God doesn't know about it, God isn't powerful enough to stop it, or God isn't good enough to even care about stopping it. So, if God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good, why does He allow bad things to happen to good people? We are so glad that you are with us today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them on. Turn them to Job chapter 1. That's where we're going to be today. We are kicking off a brand new sermon series. We're going to spend uh, the next couple of months working our way through the book of the Bible called Job. And Job is written to address what I think is probably the biggest question that we struggle with as humans, at least one of the biggest. And it's written to address this one. Why do bad things happen 
to good people? Like this is a question that we have all asked when we see somebody that we deem unworthy having to suffer. We see somebody who is unworthy, we deem unworthy of suffering and we watch them suffer. Like when we see a child get cancer or a generous person get robbed or an innocent person be condemned or a missionary be martyred or a servant be abused or a loving family get killed while the drunk driver just walks away. Like when those things happen, we don't have a category for that. Like the, I think the hardwired categories for us are that good people experience blessings, bad people experience suffering. Like that makes sense to us. We, we, we can figure that out. That makes sense. But when it doesn't happen that way, it's like something grating against our soul. It just, we just don't have a category for it. And that is the story of Job. As we kind of kick off this series and we look at Job's story, I want to start by asking you to do me a bit of a favor. I want to kind of set a scene in your mind as we begin. So would you do me a favor? I know this is a little weird. We won't do anything funny to you, but would you just, just take a moment, just close your eyes and just try to imagine with me this setting. Okay, so just close your eyes. I'll tell you when to open them, but I want you just try to try to imagine for a moment that you are in a theater, you know, a theater where they do live performances. Now imagine you're in this theater and the story of Job is playing out in front of you like a play. But in this theater, there's not one stage, but there's two. The first stage is on the floor like a regular theater stage. But I want you to imagine that there is a second stage that has been built like a, almost like a balcony above that first stage. And the reason I want to imagine this is because the story of Job has two settings. There's an earthly setting and there's a heavenly setting. So imagine that the earthly setting is taking place on the stage below and the heavenly stage is up above. Now, as you could imagine, those on the second stage, the upper stage, they can look down and they can see all that is happening on the stage below. But those on the bottom stage have no idea what is happening on the heavenly stage above them. But from your vantage point, from where you're sitting, you get to see both. Do you have that picture in your mind? If you got that picture in your mind, then you can open your eyes because we're ready to go. Let's dive into the text. The scene starts on the lower stage. It is Job chapter one, verse one. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. So the opening scene, we're introduced to the main character, and his name is Job, and he lives in Uz, which doesn't tell us a whole lot. We don't know exactly where Uz is. Uh, there's some good arguments to be made that it's actually south of Israel and east of Egypt in the area that we would call modern day Saudi Arabia. But we don't know. And we're not told much about the context of Job's life. We think that he was probably, uh, this story takes place in the time of the patriarchs. Think Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in that, in that realm. But again, we're not given a whole lot of context clues. And I think that's purposeful because I think the writer of Job wants us to look at Job as kind of the best representative of all of humanity. And so he doesn't get into a whole lot of details about Job specifically. But in the land of Uz, there lived a man named and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. So from the outset of the story, we are told that Job is blameless. Like that is first and foremost thing you need to know about Job as we enter this story. He is blameless. 
He bears no blame. The author intentionally puts Job in a category that removes all guilt from him. It is clear that none of the suffering that Job is about to endure has anything to do with the choices that Job has made. It is, comes from no malice or sin that's in his life. He is blameless. He fears God and he shuns evil. Which, by the way, shunning evil is how you know that you fear God. If you don't shun evil, that only reveals that you don't have a right fear of God. Job has both. Verse two, he had seven sons and three daughters and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys and he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the peoples of the east. Now you read this paragraph and this makes perfect sense when you consider a man like Job. Like this is what we would expect to read. Job is blameless, he is righteous, he fears God, shuns evil, what would we expect for somebody in that category? Blessings. Loads and loads of blessings. He has seven sons. That's the perfect number in scripture. He has three daughters, seven and three, ten. Complete, perfect picture of the perfect family. In a world where wealth is measured in the number of your herds, Job is overflowing with riches. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and servants galore. He has it all. He is the greatest man in the East. He's so great. Again, this is what we would expect of someone who's called blameless. But it gets even better. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthday, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So not only is Job concerned about being blameless before God, he wants to make sure his children are blameless before God. As was customary in his day, Job served as the, the priest of his family. And it was his job to stand in the gap between his children and the Lord. And so he would offer sacrifices on their behalf. Just in case, perhaps, perhaps, just in case my children have sinned and cursed God, not in their actions, not with their mouth, but in their hearts, just in case something off inside of them, I want to make sure that they stand before the Lord blameless. So he would offer sacrifices, 10 of them, one for each of his children, sacrifice to the Lord because he cared about his family. Like, like this is the perfect picture of a man who loves God. And is leading his family to love the Lord as well. In fact, we have no picture of anyone more perfect in all of scripture than Job in this moment. Outside of Jesus himself. So that's the scene on the bottom stage. And then the lights go up on the second stage. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. So in this scene, we in the audience, we get a sneak peek behind the curtain in the heavenly realm, a view, again, that those on the bottom stage do not get. And what do we see? We see a gathering of the angels of God coming before him. I want to pause for just a moment and point out something that is really important. In your Bibles, if you have them open, you'll notice that this word Lord is a capital L 
And then it's actually an uppercase O, uppercase R, uppercase D. They're just a little smaller in your text. This is really important. Sometimes the word Lord in your Bible shows up as capital L, lowercase O-R-D. But whenever you find this text where it's the uppercase letters of O-R-D, what you're reading in that moment is not the title Lord. What you're reading is actually the name of God, Yahweh. The way that our English translators have chosen to to designate the personal name of God is by giving us the the word Lord with small uppercase letters. And this is really, really important because when you read the word Lord here, we're not talking about a title, we're talking about God's personal name. In fact, I don't like it that our Bibles have done this, and so whenever I see it, I actually will read it as Yahweh. This is a name, it is God's name. It's personal, it's not a title. And so, you'll hear me as we go through, read it as such. So the angels came to present themselves before Yahweh. And Satan comes with them. Again, time out for just a second. Um, I wish I had time to wade deep into this. Like there are so, so many questions that pop out to me here. Like why is Satan coming before Yahweh? How long did Satan have access to God? Is he still got access to come make accusations against people before God? I thought he got kicked out of heaven. When did that happen? Did it happen? Like there are so many questions. And I wish I had time to get here, but I don't. But I do want you to know that that we're gonna address all of those questions on our podcast this week. So for those of you who don't know, we have a podcast every Monday that I... We record with a couple of our pastors and we're gonna talk through all of those questions. And if you have questions, then we wanna give you the opportunity. You can always text in or email your questions to our podcast and we will address them on the podcast. There's a lot that we get to cover this week. So if you have not subscribed yet, wherever you subscribe to podcasts, find the Quad City Podcast and you can join us there. Okay, back to our text. The angels come before Yahweh. And Satan comes with them. More accurately, the Satan comes with them. Satan is actually a title. Long before it was a name, we know of our enemy as Satan. But before it was a name, it was a title. It simply means accuser. So the accuser came with the rest of the angels The accuser comes before Yahweh, and what has the accuser been doing? He's been roaming the earth, apparently looking for people to accuse of wrongdoing before Yahweh. Turns out he is the cosmic tattletale. And no doubt he would have had a lot of people that he could have rightly brought accusations against before Yahweh, but look what happens. Then Yahweh said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Again, no doubt the accuser could bring charges against so many people, but Yahweh says, but but, have you, have you noticed Job though? Have you noticed Job? That man blameless. Again, don't miss this. Yahweh calls Job blameless. God himself looks at Job and says, that man is upright. He fears me and shuns evil. God calls him blameless. It isn't Job calling himself blameless. God declares Job blameless and upright. Like if that is not a stamp of approval on Job's life, I don't know what is. And it is God, not Satan, who shines the spotlight on Job. It's God who offers up Job as 
as someone the accuser should look at to try to find something to accuse him of. But there's nothing. But the accuser snaps back and says, there's a reason he's blameless. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hand so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. Of course, Job is blameless. God, his life is perfect. You've shielded him. You've protected him. Like that hedge of protection that you heard your grandparents pray for so many times, Job actually had it. He was protected and Satan couldn't get to him. And so Satan comes at Yahweh with this accusatory request, but stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Essentially what Satan is saying is, he doesn't love you. God, he doesn't love you. What he loves is what you've given him. That's what he loves. He wants all of the gifts, but he does not care about the giver. He is only faithful to you because of the way that you have blessed him. But if you take away his blessings, if you take away all of his stuff, he won't just curse you in his heart. Oh, no, 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 no. He will curse you to your face. Now, the question that I ask when I read this is, why does, why does Satan think that would happen? Why is he so confident that Job would just curse God to his face? Why does he think that's true? And the answer I came up with is because he's seen it. Because he's watched it. He's witnessed this happen time and again. And my guess is you have too. You've watched people do this. You've watched people who claim to love the Lord end up cursing him to his face. They once claimed to love the Lord, but then they disavow any and all allegiance to him because something they ultimately loved more than Yahweh was taken from them. And when the thing that they loved more was taken away, their love for God went with it. Yet Yahweh somehow thinks things would be different with Job. Yahweh seems to believe that Job wouldn't do that. And so... Yahweh says to Satan, very well then. Everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. So God offers up for the accuser power over all of the blessings that he has given Job. Everything. Everything that made him the greatest in the East was given over for Satan to do with what he wants. Why? Because Yahweh believes that first and foremost in Job's heart that he matters more than everything else. Yahweh believes that to Job he matters more than cattle and camels and kids. And I can't help but wonder, do you think God would be as confident in us as he was in Job? Like, do you think God would be willing to stake his reputation on our allegiance to him? Do you think God would be willing to stake his reputation on our devotion to the gift giver 
above the gifts. Now, one other thing we need to note here. Um, Many people have this idea that there's this vast cosmic war in heaven of good versus evil, God versus Satan, that there's like struggling over which one's going to win, the ultimate yin and yang of good versus evil. That's not the biblical picture here at all or anywhere else in Scripture. Scripture makes it clear. God is supreme over all, and Satan is not God's evil opposite. That is not how this works. We see this in the text. Satan can do nothing outside of God's permission, and God has the ability to draw the line on how far Satan can go. Satan is not God's evil opposite. But frankly, that to me makes the question of why do bad things happen to good people even more confounding. God has essentially offered up everything Job has to Satan to do with what he wishes, but he draws the line and says, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. And with that boundary set, and Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh. And that upper stage goes dark and the lower stage lights up again. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put your servants to the sword and I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you while he was still speaking. Yet another messenger came and said, your son, and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Have you ever been in the ocean and you're playing and then you try to get out and then you get caught in the surf and a wave knocks you down and while you're trying to get up another wave hits and then another wave hits and you're you're just rolling in the surf trying to figure out which way is up to get your head above water but they keep coming again and again that's what you should feel when you read this text Everything in Job's life is taken from him. First, it was the oxen and the donkeys, and they're stolen, and the servants who were watching were murdered, and that, that would be horrible news. That's horrible news. And no doubt, it caused great concern for Job, but you can replace oxen and donkeys, right? But before he even has time to process, Job learns That fire from God, don't miss that. Fire from God has fallen and has wiped out all of Job's sheep and the servants with them. And now his concern is turned into panic in a world where animals are your wealth. Job's wealth has now been ravaged, it's gone. But that's not all. Another servant lets him know the camels have been stolen and the servants have been murdered. And then comes the worst news of all. All of his children, all of them, not half of them, not one of them, all of them are dead. Any of these tragedies would send most of us over the edge, but Job is forced to endure them all in one afternoon. Before we go any further, I want you just to sit in the weight of this for just a moment. 
Because it's really easy for us to look at this and we know the story, we know how it ends and we just kind of brush past this part. But imagine you don't know. I want you to feel the weight of this. Like what would be the equivalent of this for you? Like, I want you to think about your resources, all of your financial resources. I want you to think about your retirement accounts, your stock portfolio, your cash reserves, all of your financial resources. Imagine today you get a call that they're all gone. Like they're gone, like there's been a bank failure or the stock market crash or some Bernie Madoff scheme you got caught up in and now all of your financial resources are gone. How would you feel? And and, and if that's not bad enough, no sooner than you get off the phone with your broker than you learn that lightning has striked your business. Like, Like your business, lightning has struck and everything that you had in your possession to help you make money is gone. Like all of your resources... All of your tools, all of your trucks, all of, your, all of the accounts that, that you've garnered for decades, all of the paperwork, even all of your employees, they're all gone. All of those financial resources that you accrued, there's now no way to replace them because everything you had to help you make money, it's gone. And no sooner than you get that money, you get a call from the police And they say, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but there's been a sinkhole in your neighborhood. And it opened up on your street and your home was taken and it's gone. And your kids were in it. And we did everything that we could to try to get them out, but we couldn't save them so sorry for your loss. Like I know this seems so over the top and we can hardly imagine it, but just try to go there. Think of the worst loss you've ever experienced and multiply it by a hundred. That was Job. He went from being the greatest man in in the east to being a pauper in a day. He's lost everything. How would you respond in that moment? Here's Job's response. At this, Job got up and he tore his robe and he shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshiped him. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. Yahweh gave and Yahweh has taken away. May the name of Yahweh be praised. Like Job's first response is exactly what we would expect. He tore his robe and he shaves his head. This is a sign of outward mourning, like like the worst kind of heavy pain and suffering, mourning and loss that you could imagine. Everybody sees it. And that's right. This is worth mourning. It's all worth mourning. It should cause mourning. He's hurting. He's in pain. And yet in the midst of his suffering, a suffering on the scale that we can't imagine, his instinct is not to stand up and to raise a fist at God. Instead, it is to fall down on his knees and worship him. And don't miss this. Job doesn't blame Satan for what has happened. Again, he has no idea what has happened in the heavenly realm. Here's what Job knows. Everything he has was a gift from God. And everything is ultimately under God's control. And so if it is taken away from him, it can only be done by God or at least with God's permission. And in that moment, with that realization, Job's heart is still 
to worship him. And the reason he worships him is because Job recognizes all of the blessings and all of the gifts, it's all temporary. Job recognizes, I came naked from my mother's womb and naked I'm going to depart. I came into the world with nothing and I'm going to leave with nothing. And all of the blessings that I got on this earth in the meantime, is temporary. They were all going to go away at some point. Either they were going to go away or I was going to go away. But there was going to be a day when all of these blessings would be left behind. And in that moment, when all of the blessings are left behind, when all of the gifts, they would matter no more, the only thing that would matter in that moment was the relation, relationship with the gift giver. In the moment where he lost everything, Job through his actions revealed that his relationship with the gift giver was the most important thing he had all along. He worshiped the Lord when he had everything. And he worshiped the Lord when he had nothing. Because his worship was driven by the only thing that mattered, his relationship with God. And in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Now here's what I know. Many of you are suffering. You're suffering loss. Many of you have suffered loss. And without knowing, some of you will be suffering loss really soon. Some of you are in it right now. You're suffering the loss of a marriage or the loss of a home, the loss of employment or the loss of a child. You're suffering the loss of wealth or the loss of friendships Maybe it's the loss of your hearing or, or your eyesight or your mental capacity. Maybe it's you've lost your connection with your kids or your connection with your parents. But you've lost something and you've lost something that means so much to you. You've lost something that has been such a blessing and now it's gone. And you have to decide now. What matters more to me? What do I cherish more? The blessings or the blesser? The gifts or the gift giver? The question we have to wrestle with today, is God only worthy of your worship when he gives or is he also worthy of your worship when he takes away? Is he only worthy of your worship when he gives or is he also worthy of your worship when he takes away? That's the question I want to leave you with today. I want to leave us sitting in the tension that Job's story brings us to. In just a moment, on both of our campuses, our worship leaders are going to come out. And they're going to sing a song. Some of you may know it. And I just want you to sit with this question. Is God still worthy of worship? even when he takes away. And you can stand and you can sing it if your heart's there to prepared to do that. You can sit and have it sung over you. You can lay in the floor and weep if you don't know what else to do. But I just want us to sit with the question today. Are we in the same camp of Job that he's worthy of our worship not just when he gives, but also when he takes away.
Father, we come today, and on the scale of suffering, we are all over the map in our gathering today. Some of us are suffering little and some are suffering much, but this question is at the heart of our worship of you no matter where we are. So we bring ourselves before you whatever condition our heart is in and I pray through the mighty power of the Holy Spirit that you would meet us in this moment and speak to our hearts exactly what we need and transform us. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.